Hello, good morning, good afternoon to our audience joining us from various time zones. I'm Raymond Kerr, I'm the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, thank you for making the time to join us for this latest webinar titled The European Union and the Gulf Cooperation Council, A New Path for Cooperation? Question mark. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, our speakers and moderator who are uh, joining us from all around the world, uh, be it in the UK, France, Italy, Bahrain, and Australia. Uh, thank you for waking up early or staying up late to make this uh, program happen. Our panel is also numerically larger than usual today, and our speakers have long lists of accomplishments. Uh, so I'll be very brief in my introduction and invite you to read their full bios uh, on our website uh, through the link that I'll share in the, in the chat shortly. Um, I will start with uh, Adel Abdel Ghaffar, a non-resident fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution and a fellow at the Brookings Doha Center, where he was previously acting director of research. He specializes in political economy and his research interests include state society relations, socioeconomic development, and foreign policy in the Middle East and North Africa. Also with us is Hana al Mubayid, a research fellow at the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. Her research explores the influence of social dynamics on attitudes toward work, education, and career choices and youth transitions in the GCC states. Also with us is Sylvia Colombo, a senior fellow in the Mediterranean, Middle East, and Africa program at the Instituto Afari Internazionale. I hope I didn't butcher that. She is an expert on Middle Eastern politics and is working on Euro-Mediterranean cooperation, transatlantic relations in the Mediterranean, and domestic and regional politics in the Arab world. Last but not least is our good friend Omar Labaidli, a non-resident fellow at AGSIW and the director of research at the Assad in Bahrain. He is also an affiliated associate professor of economics at George Mason University, an affiliated a senior research fellow at Mercatus Center, and an adjunct visiting professor at the King Fahad University of Petroli Petroleum and Minerals. Moderating the session today is Emma Soubrier, a non-resident fellow at AGSIW, and a visiting scholar at the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Her research focuses on the security strategies and foreign policies of the countries of the GCC, particularly the UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the political economy of arms trade in the Gulf. I should also mention uh, that although this is not a book launch, uh, we have invited uh, Dr. Abdel Ghaffar and Dr. Palumbo to discuss their recently published volume, The European Union and the Gulf Cooperation Council Towards a New Path, which expands on many of the issues that we're discussing today. If you are interested um, uh, in purchasing the book, uh, the publisher has offered a special discount of 20% off the printed uh, book and ebook. Um, and I will uh, share the token and the, and the website link in the chat shortly as well. And with that, uh, Emma, over to you. Hello, um, hi everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Raymond, and thank you everyone for being here. It is a pleasure and an honor to get to moderate a conversation on such a timely topic as actors both inside and outside the Gulf region are pondering what the path forward is in the faith of um, in the face of a number of general and specific evolutions affecting the Gulf and beyond including but not limited to the U.S. Recal recalibration of its engagement in the region and fluctuation in oil prices and um, the confirmation of human security challenges uh, all over the world with the coronavirus pandemic and the dire and increasing effects of global warming. Amid these uh, shifts at every level, it is interesting to talk about the relationships uh, between the European Union and the Gulf Cooperation Council. And uh, I really highly recommend the reading of the excellent book edited by Adel and Sylvia, uh, The European Union and the Gulf Cooperation Council Towards a New Path, that offers a lot of food for thought in this regard. Um, so as we know, relations between Europe and the GCC countries can be traced back to 1985, a uh, joint ministerial meeting between the European Council at the time and the GCC, uh, followed by negotiations that led to the signing of a cooperation agreement between the two regions in 88, uh, that aimed to eventually negotiate a free trade agreement. However, not only did the FTA never see the light of day, but multilateral uh, cooperation remains limited, with most engagement still happening between individual European and Gulf countries. 
So today this delay and struggle is even more um, surprising or disappointing perhaps, given that the EU and the GCC share common interests in the fields of trade, energy and security, of course, but also climate change and culture. So to start off and dive into the reasons for such tardiness uh, maybe and challenges, despite how fruitful these ties could be, uh, I would like to first turn to you, Sylvia, um, and ask, could you maybe walk us through the broader context of this inter-regional inter relationship? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. Thank you to, to the Institute for hosting us uh, today. It's really a pleasure uh, to, to participate in this webinar with uh, uh, esteemed colleagues and friends with whom we have shared uh, this uh, work that has produced the book uh, uh, that appeared recently with Palgrave. Um, my name is Silvia Colombo and uh, um, I mean, I've been working uh, for the past, uh, let's say, seven, eight years on EU GCC relations, uh, mostly from the institutional perspective, trying to look uh, at uh, what has worked and what has not uh, in the multilateral relations and uh, uh, exactly what are the ways that could be found uh, and tried to, to unleash the potential of this uh, relationship. Uh, this question is more um, relevant today than uh, it was in the past, uh, because as you, Emma, said, there are a number of transformations that have gone on uh, in the past decade, mainly uh, uh, I mean, on the EU level, of course, within the GCC as such, and individual countries of the GCC that have had uh, I've seen uh, their role uh, um, regionally in foreign policy uh, grow uh, ex exponentially. But also, we have to we cannot forget the broader uh, global and international uh, transformation that are um, putting a lot of uh, pressure, I would say, onto the EU uh, to uh, consider um, the relations, to reconsider its relations to the, to the Gulf more broadly, uh, and uh, in particular to the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council. Um, and the, this is a very important point. I mean, this distinction sometimes between the multilateral track, the EU GCC track that looks very institutionalized, but very uh, low key in this, uh, the strategic, uh, let's say, priority list of the European Union, um, uh, today is uh, kind of as exploded let's say into um, the i mean the much more uh, important role that uh, uh, cooperating with the Gulf uh, can have for the European Union and for Europe in general. So I think it's important, first and foremost, if we really want to move forward, uh, to start discussing UGC, the UGCC framework work within the context, uh, the broader context of uh, Europe-Gulf cooperation. And uh, this is not uh, an easy shift, I would say, uh, also from the point of view of the European policymakers, if you see it from that perspective, because as Emma said, uh, actually, uh, I mean, the, the relationship uh, uh, was, of course, uh, um, I mean, uh, at the beginning of uh, quite a long, uh, I mean, a relationship um, and the ambitious uh, at the very beginning in terms of the areas that uh, the cooperation agreement was meant to, to cover, the action plan that was negotiated later on. Um, but uh, uh, it was sometimes very much kept separate from the broader uh, regional framework and in particular for, from the major focus that the EU has been developing towards the southern Mediterranean or the Middle East. And uh, this does not sustain itself anymore, as we have seen, because the Gulf players and the GCC countries in particular have become much more uh, involved into the security and political economy of the broader uh, regional setting. And so from, from the point of view of the EU, it's really important uh, to take this uh, uh, point into account, uh, the fact that we need to enter uh, much more into a Europe Gulf era and not uh, necessarily a EU GCC era, which of course serves the purpose of uh, keeping a channel of communication alive between uh, two important regional bodies, but uh, it's not necessarily the setting in which, uh, um, I mean, uh, the chances of the region uh, will, be, will be decided. And in order to explore that and to continue the conversation, I would like to point to three uh, of the main shortcomings that have traditionally and historically uh, affected the, the multilateral UGCC framework. As I said, from the very beginning, back in 1988, there was a sort of a structural tension embedded into the UGCC framework, which we haven't 
been able to dispel uh, and overcome uh, as of now. And this tension uh, relates to this uh, structural factors uh, in three main domains. Uh, the first domain is the content dimension. The second domain is the actors of this relationship. And the third domain, which is the overarching one, I would say, is the format that has been given to this specific relationship. So, with very briefly, with regard to the content, um, as Emma already said, that there has always been a lingering tension between the economic, uh, let's say, side of the cooperation, the fact that the Gulf the GCC countries uh, were uh, extremely important for many um, for the EU, the European uh, member states in terms as main providers of energy. And also there was this idea of developing a region to region uh, free trade agreement. Uh, this was intention and was uh, sometimes in contradiction to the way in which the political side of the relationship was uh, was dealt with, the fact that uh, on both sides the the, the 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 idea that there were too many requests or uh, I mean too um, uh, it was difficult to reconcile a number of uh, uh, of imperatives related to the domestic and internal political landscape of of the two regions made uh, this uh, the evolution of this relationship much more complex than expected. And uh, we can argue, of course, that many of the issues that brought to the failure of the FTA have, uh, didn't have to do with the politics. Uh, but indeed, it's not a surprise that the collapse of the negotiations happened in 2008. I would say this is, I mean, of course, when uh, not only the, 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 the shock of the uh, global uh, financial and economic uh, uh, crisis started to hit uh, Europe uh, and the turning the balance of power between the two from the economic point of view, but also this uh, so, so, sort of fatigue and frustration uh, with uh, the rhetoric of, you know, uh, bringing democracy, uh, developing a, a framework of, for freedoms, human rights, which had, has always been in the courts of the EU's foreign policy. And at that time, it was very much uh, in, in trouble, not just with regard to the Gulf. The second aspect related to the actors, and I know uh, my, my friend and colleague Hannah will go more into that, is the tension that has tended to exist between the cooperation with the governments, the institutional framework of, you know, uh, the high ministerial meetings, uh, the, uh, the fact that, uh, of course, uh, being the way in which the GCC countries themselves are constructed, uh, the main channel of communication, of action, the negotiations has always uh, taken place uh, at that level, at the level of the elites, at the level of of the officials in the, in the government, disregard the, the, the people, uh, Damien, which has, in, in my view and in the view of other uh, scholars, uh, put a lot of uh, a lot of strain on the onto the institutional relationship. Uh, all the questions that negotiated the deals so, or the the, uh, the the agreements with the EU. Uh, I mean, we know it cannot be taken for granted also as we have seen in the past 10 years and so this uh, um, questioning of uh, of uh, of um, of the right actors to, with whom to engage has always been also uh, some a process that the the EU has gone through in the past decade uh, and uh, um, the idea that there has always been a lack of connections uh, people to people connections uh, through students uh, uh, through mobility of course uh, uh, through even a the, um, the, the possibility to communicate a, a more uh, realistic image of, of the other part. I mean, if you take uh, into account the newspaper accounts, the way in which the public perception of many of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries in Europe still remain very much linked to, yes, uh, uh, you know, money, investments. Uh, um, I mean, sometimes, uh, of course, the issue of you no know, respect of, for human rights, uh, tensions, crisis, but uh, really the, uh, there is not an accurate uh, knowledge and depiction of uh, the other side. And this uh, goes also in the other direction. And so uh, really uh, this has created a, a gap in the possibility to move the relationship forward. And of course, there are many um, ideas or many uh, instruments that could be tried 
uh, through education, uh, through mobility, as I said, in order to start overcome this process uh, problem, sorry, not just between the two regions, but starting, of course, uh, from within uh, the region itself, which has made, in the case of the GCC countries, a lot of advancements in the past uh, few years, but uh, also following the coronavirus, uh, um, you know, uh, pandemic, um, I mean, much still remains to be done. And finally, and an overarching point that I think has represented a structural constraint or shortcoming of this uh, relationship and that still needs to be worked on is uh, the tension between the bilateral uh, and the multilateral dimension, uh, which again, it's not just peculiar of this specific relationship. In the end, we are talking of a region to region relationship, but uh, everybody has been, everything has been uh, subsumed uh, uh, under, uh, you know, bilateral relationships. The, the strong bilateral bilateralism of of uh, uh, European foreign policy, uh, I mean, has started quite long ago and as seen actually in the Gulf, uh, uh, in the uh, Arab Gulf, uh, uh, it's most a success. Uh, you know, if you take the example of France, uh, if you take the example of all the other countries that cultivate their own uh, specific national interests, sometimes uh, using just the cost coverage of the EU multilateral framework uh, when it comes, you know, to criticizing or to, uh, to criticizing the respect, the lack of respect for human rights or, uh, you know, advancing um, uh, on uh, other multilateral issues that, however, remain uh, quite, uh, quite limited. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, we cannot expect much in this respect uh, because this uh, trend, uh, this trend towards bilateralism is, uh, is ongoing and will uh, remain. However, there could be a way to, to turn it a little bit or to channel it into the direction of uh, not uh, undermining completely the multilateral framework. i give you just one example, you know, about this maritime mission, uh, EMASO, uh, in the Strait of Hormuz, where, uh, you know, you have the participation, a French-led mission, a participation of a number of European Member states, I mean, putting a multilateral cap onto this relationship uh, and strengthening the multilateral component could be a way to, uh, from the uh, from the EU and from Europe in general, to show that it's not just you know individual member states taking their own decisions, but really that the multilateral framework uh, still counts, and that there is a lot that the EU as an institution can offer. It's a multivariable geometry uh, as an institution. It can be again, yeah member states, the EU institutions, specific ad hoc uh, um, formats, such as we know about the E3, the E4. So this variable geometry, this flexibility that despite the appearance the EU can offer could also be a way to uh, revamp uh, and uh, uh, the uh, EU GCC uh, relations. Many thanks. I'll stop here, but uh, I'll be happy Thank to you. continue and take some questions and comments. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Uh, this was a perfect introduction to all of these uh, topics that we'll discuss today. Um, these, uh, the, the, the way you frame the, the different structural challenges in terms of uh, contact actors and, and format is extremely clear. And I think a question that we'll come back to is this idea of how do you frame EU GCC relations within the broader Europe Gulf relations, as we know, uh, those, those two are really variable geometry on both sides. And, uh, and thank you so much. For now, uh, as you mentioned, I, um, I would like to turn to you, Hannah. Um, I really enjoyed the chapter you wrote on the issue of you know, technical and vocational education and training, uh, specifically in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I, I, I was wondering, could you please tell us more about these educational aspects of the EU GCC relation, uh, the challenges that need to be tackled, and how the interregional relation could be particularly fitting to address them. Thank you so much, um, and thank you, Sylvia, kind of for the overview and backdrop. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, and talk a little bit about my research uh, within this context. So I predominantly look at the way young people um, in Saudi Arabia transition from education to work, uh, and specifically into vocational education and training. So looking at what uh, vocational education and training kind of goals are within the GCC, and then looking at how you know the diversity of TVET uh, technical vocational 
vocational education and training uh, TVET programs in Europe are, it's really interesting because um, I think a lot of the GCC states are looking for a, you know, a solution, a one size fits all solution. And what the EU um, does is actually highlight that there isn't one approach to vocational education and training. There really isn't one approach to education in general, but specifically with TVET, that's a really good area to kind of really highlight, you know, the ways that um, context is, is the most important aspect to, uh, to consider when looking at educational structures and educational processes. So I do think that, you know, in general, GCC countries really do express admiration for the achievements of European countries, especially in education. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, the existence of Western institutions within the region, in the form of schools, universities in the past and, and, and even now, um, with satellite universities and different campuses being there, uh, whether they're European or just Western in general, which this is another issue, um, it, it shows that there's a clear indication of a desire to foster a kind of a long-term relationship from the European side and the Western side, and perhaps even an indication then that there's an acceptance of this on the GCC side. Um, and this is why you see so many of the GCC states um, encouraging uh, you know, scholarships abroad until now, their education systems are, you know, uh, are seen as a one option, but there still is this huge push to be educated abroad and more opportunities often are available to those who come back to the GCC states with degrees um, from, from European or American universities. Uh, or Australian ones or Western ones in general. But I think in more contemporary relationships, kind of European countries are, as Sylvia mentioned, reluctant to engage um, openly unless the agenda includes a reference to human rights, unless the, uh, the agenda includes reference specifically to women's rights, uh, migrant workers and, and the like. Um, and the GCC countries are very keen to use European measures uh, when benchmarking their own progress, but it's also then that it's kind of where there, there's a divergence. So there's this focus really on um, the practical know-how that exists within uh, the EU that the you know Gulf states are happy to take on. Um, but then I feel like the disconnect happens when you're not necessarily then referencing things that have to do with um, specifically advancing kind of the question of women um, or our human rights in general. But in the education space, I think there's this mismatch between expectations and priorities, which inhibits the pro progress related to both scientific research in higher education, as well as um, uh, vocational education. Uh, and because the GCC countries are now facing this impending economic challenge of the reduced demand for oil, but in, you know, also fluctuating oil prices and growing populations, the education development agendas are really fueled by this human capital approach, you know, investing more in people in order for our economies to be saved and the labor market dynamics to improve. Um, so they're really looking for quick fixes. And that's why when you look at maybe successful vocational education programs in certain countries within the EU, uh, they look very appealing and there's this almost um, this hope that you can bring this in wholesale and uh, implement in, uh, you know, the German model, uh, for instance. Uh, but education really does highlight this. I think, uh, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, only this week, talking about benchmarking, they announced that all 10 year olds are going to sit pearls this year. So the pearls is the progress um, in international reading uh, literacy study. Uh, and in 2016, for instance, 50 countries took part in PEARLS, including all six GCC countries. Um, and um, it, this is conducted by the International uh, Association for the Evaluation of Education Achievement, which is based in the Netherlands. So they run these large scale comparative studies every five years to track educational achievement and other aspects of education. Um, they also conduct the TIMS, which is the Trends in Math and Science um, study, and um, also, again, and most UCC countries, I think all six have participated in that in 2015 or 16. And then they also um, are very keen to track their PISA results. So the program for international student assessment, which it assesses 15 year olds on maths and science progress every three years. So we're really, you know, in the GCC using these benchmarks to see how good we're doing in education um, in general, kind of general uh, education and progress. But, and despite, funnily actually, despite the criticism um, 
and women's opportunities, what these benchmarks always reveal is how much better girls do and how much more they outperform boys in all GCC countries. But anyway, the issue is uh, the participation in these studies highlights aspects of education that are related to standards that were set by European policymakers outside of the GCC. So despite there being much less kind of participatory engagement in the education process in the GCC, we're still using those benchmarks. Uh, it's a very different context and there's very little input that happens from kind of parents and students when you're thinking about what the education achievements uh, should be and what the education policy should achieve. Uh, and that's, you know, it's very much a participatory process in the EU. So I think that there, this disconnect is something that is not discussed. So with, with adopting these benchmarks, you're ignoring that aspect of it on almost, you know, without just blindly accepting that this will work, these benchmarks are the ones that we need to be using uh, because they're comparative and they're international and they're, um, you know, basically looked at as the gold standard. Um, and benchmarking is such a big aspect of the visions, you know, using examples of what's successful elsewhere is so important. Um, and developing your KPIs based on what was successful elsewhere is very important, regardless of actually looking at the contextual dif differences and challenges, I think. Um, so I think there's it's necessary to have a dialogue about the ultimate goals related to that benchmarking and collaboration in the education space. So if there is room for collaboration and we are using these benchmarks and standards in these tests, why and how can they better serve the education kind of um, goals within the GCC states? I think that's a really important question is what do we need within the GCC states and how then can we benefit from what's happened within the EU? Um, and I think, you know, um, basically one area I think it's really important is, is the, again, vocational education, but looking at, you know, German and Nordic states are considered the best, you know, best in show in this area. And the Gulf states are constantly trying to emulate those systems. So, you know, one of the things that I argue in the chapter that I contributed to um, in this book and in general, is that instead of looking at these models uh, that may have been successful in Germany, is instead to look at the way other countries have benefited from kind of being within the EU uh, through a contribution to concrete mechanisms that provide, for instance, pathways into various forms of education and training. So I look at, for instance, push and pull factors that are common, um, which is really important to think that these are common factors, but then understand how they fit contextually and how they address the unique challenges in the GCC. So just to give you an example of one pull factor, for instance, you're thinking of ways to develop equitable routes into vocational education. Um, in Saudi Arabia, for instance, the focus there is on changing people's mindsets. So making sure that more people go into vocational education uh, through telling them that it's it's actually a great pathway. This is something that's you know wonderful, and that you can find a job uh, you know in in your field after you go through a two year diploma program versus a four year academic or five year academic program. Now the issue with that is the rest of the kind of economic structure doesn't necessarily support that. And once you've gone into vocational education, there really aren't a lot of other options for you. You've made made your choice, and now there are no other pathways if you've changed your mind. Uh, so thinking about how within European countries, there are flexible routes in and out of all different types of education, this is something that you can learn from. How can this then pull people into vocational education? Stop thinking about mindset, create structures and systems that are not necessarily cultural, but actually structural uh, that do provide opportunity. So looking at that as an example of how we can learn from what's happened and how other countries learn from what's happened um, in, for instance, Germany, uh, you know, and, and how they've adopted elements of these systems uh, that are that are again, common, but not necessarily specific to the cultural and historical um, attributes of the systems themselves. Uh, so, I mean, I think that that's, you know, the, the issue of not taking wholesale solutions from the EU model is really important, but looking at ways that cooperation, uh, what cooperation looks like, and then seeing how that can happen. And I think the last thing I'd say to this before um, handing back to you is that one area where this would actually be really important is thinking about how GCC states are 
you know, open to one another in terms of citizens being able to go work in different countries within the GCC. Um, but then the qualification systems are developed on a national level and they are not necessarily um, uh, complementary. And so there isn't enough building on kind of previous learning there isn't enough uh, in terms of recognition of, you know, kind of levels and it becomes very difficult uh, even when, you know, students go abroad and come back, uh, whether it's, you know, students going to Kuwait and coming back to Saudi or, or, or to Bahrain and coming back to Saudi, you have issues with, you know, you have to then make sure that your degree is recognized. It's a process. It's not, there's no agreement at that GCC level as of now. And these are, again, things I think that you could really learn uh, from in, with, uh, with looking at the structure in the EU. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hannah. That's uh, that's really a fascinating topic. And what I what I heard in your presentation, and that connects to what Sylvia was also talking about, be it through you know the benchmarking uh, processes, but also this discussion between GCC countries and European countries with this idea that there's one size fits all in the European countries saying, well, actually not, not necessarily. What I hear in, in the conversation so far is that there's really a need for flexibility and fluidity in not, not only the way we think about the relations between Europe and the Gulf, but also in terms of content, what, what is actually the content of, of uh, this cooperation. So I think this is really fascinating. Thank you. Um, and the reason why it's so particularly interesting to see well both the context set by Sylvia and these, this educational aspect is, is, of course, that it's less often covered uh, by the literature and discussion about uh, Europe, uh, Europe Gulf relations which is not surprising, of course, given the, in the importance of two other dimensions in this inter-regional relation, namely the economic aspect and the security angle. So on this note, uh, I will turn to you, Omar, uh, and, uh, and ask you, could you please uh, walk us through these aspects of the relationship, the economic aspect of, of EU GCC relations and the, the challenges and, and how is uh, Europe, uh, the European actors particularly fitting to, to answer some of those uh, challenges? Thank you, Emma, and thank you to AGSRW for the invitation to participate today. Uh, so just to frame very briefly uh, uh, the economic relations, uh, it's important to note that EU policy historically when it comes to trade uh, is very much uh, uh, mixes economics with non-economic factors. Uh, a good uh, uh, illustration of that is that the EU has, which doesn't have many free trade agreements, has a free trade agreement with Palestine and with Israel. Uh, and, you know, Certainly in the Palestinian case, this is economically completely irrelevant to the EU, uh, but clearly it represents the importance or the manner in which the EU uh, deploys its trade policy as a means to realize nominally non-economic goals. On the GCC side, you have something similar in that the GCC countries want to try to use their economic relations, if they can, to uh, protect their security interests, in particular, yeah, as was uh, clearly reflected in the case of Kuwait uh, in, in 1990, uh, you have a situation where you know, these are rich, small, rich countries, uh, which have you know been part of the international system as, as sovereign states for a, a, a limited amount of time, uh, and a multitude of security threats uh, in, in the immediate vicinity and beyond. And so they see trade deals with large entities like the EU beyond any economic returns as a ways of legitimizing their sovereignty uh, and of saying, you know, you can't mess with us because, you know, we're, the EU considers us to be worthy of a free trade agreement. We're not just some, uh, uh, nobody's in the middle of the desert. Uh, so these economic, these non-economic factors uh, are a double-edged sword because, um, and sometimes they promote, they help the two sides to reach an agreement and sometimes to, to integrate further economically and sometimes they work against. Uh, on the pro side, you know, the EU, and this is, you know, something which has become very stark in the last week with this whole France, Australia, you know, split, uh, it, you know, yearns for geopolitical influence that, uh, that it doesn't necessarily, uh, hasn't realized fully. Uh, and so one of its strategies is to try to get geopolitical influence by making 
by, by uh, putting the economic uh, putting its own economic interests in its free trade agreements. For example, if you want a free trade agreement with us, you have to have better respect for worker rights or better respect for human rights, or <clears throat> you have to do more to protect the environment and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and, and their success story, uh, the poster child for European Union success in that regard would be Eastern Europe post uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, whereby countries that were you know, a long way from uh, uh, liberal democracies and a long way from uh, you know, high living standards have, as a direct consequence, uh, it's no exaggeration to say, of integrating with the EU, realized much higher living standards, much more political liberties, civil liberties, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the EU would love what it did with Eastern Europe to be replicated elsewhere. And I think the GCC is one of the areas where we'd like to see that sort of uh, approach come to fruition. On the GCC side, uh, uh, it wants, as I say, it craves the recognition of the EU on, in, the, in the geopolitical sense. But sometimes these things work against, and in, in the in, in you know human rights in particular in the past have been an issue of consternation uh, between the two sides, and also climate uh, climate change. Uh, as you're all aware, the Gulf countries are some of the highest. Uh, per capita uh, uh, energy consumers in the world. Part of that is because it's so hot and we need air conditioners, uh, but that's not the only reason. Uh, by any metric, uh, uh, the GCC countries are, are, are high consumers of energy, uh, and this creates tension between the two sides. Uh, now, despite these potentially conflicting interests, uh, they did make significant progress on FTA, FTA but as Sylvia mentioned, uh, this sort of dramatically um, blew up in 2008 with the GCC uh, uh, leaving or suspending, unilaterally suspending uh, negotiations. Now, I've heard various stories about why this has happened, but of late, I've arrived at what seems to be a consensual opinion on what exactly stopped these uh, free trade negotiations. Uh, and despite the sometimes advertised claim that it was human rights uh, issues, uh, appears, having spoken to people both on the EU and the GC side, that EU human rights issues were not at least officially the problem. The problem was some technical issue relating to export quotas and uh, export tariffs on, uh, on uh, uh, petrochemical exports in Saudi Arabia, which seems like a pretty uh, silly thing to stop uh, uh, as, as an important agreement as EU GCC trade on. Um, and for that reason, uh, uh, well, that leads me to two conclusions. First of all, that it may be the case that there were some unwritten differences, uh, undeclared differences on some other dimensions that, that led to the EU putting its foot down on something which seems so irrelevant. Uh, and it's not clear what those other interests are, but there are some mysterious factor X in the background. Uh, and also it means that it means me, I'm quite positive about this issue being resolved in the coming period, because, you know, as you've seen with this Australian submarines issue, uh, uh, you know, the EU is po possibly even less influential, uh, or at least its main elements, or main elements, even less influential than it thought. Uh, uh, and so, you know, what better way uh, the, to reverse that and to strike some high profile free trade deals or economic integration agreements with countries and try to bring them into your geopolitical orbit, especially uh, when those countries welcome that opportunity uh, uh, and, and would be would happily reciprocate. Uh, in addition to that, I would say that uh, uh, even though the EU, the GCC countries have historically been anti uh, or not particularly interested in pursuing environmental goals, that has changed for a variety of structural reasons in the last five years. Uh, and there's a big opportunity uh, uh, for, uh, for the EU and the GCC to, you know, to fly the, uh, uh, to fly the uh, flag of uh, uh, prote protecting the environment, uh, at least in a, in a way that is politically uh, uh, satisfactory to both sides, setting aside the actual uh, sacrifices that may, may or may not need to be made on the ground. Um, so I'm confident that they can actually make progress and they can work together on this. Uh, and as a final factor, uh, just building on what uh, Hanert said, the, uh, so the uh, GCC countries with these visions, uh, in addition to the education blueprints uh, uh, that they wish to import, uh, uh, there's very much, you know, technology transfer is, has always been uh, uh, at the forefront. In the past, uh, technology transfer 
has been something which the DCC countries have approached in a turnkey way. And by that, I mean, they'll import the European or Western personnel uh, uh, and the knowledge will stay embodied in them, but will be physically located at least, albeit temporarily in the GCC. Of late, they've realized that that doesn't work and they're willing to take steps to reverse it. And now you're seeing much greater effort at having these foreign experts, these Western experts transfer their knowledge to a, 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 you know, a young, a gen, new generation of young, competent, uh, uh, you know, Saudis, Kuwaitis, Qataris, et cetera, et cetera, who, are, who have been trained in some of the best universities in the world and are exposed to things much more than before. Uh, and in that respect, uh, the GCC uh, should be extra excited about the prospect of, uh, of striking uh, a, a deal with the EU. And just to add to Hanat's uh, comment about the education imports as well, one program as a researcher who resides in GCC, which I would love to see replicated is the Erasmus program uh, in, in, in European Union, which sees, you know, which probably uh, maybe Emma and Sylvia, you've been part of yourselves, uh, uh, whereby, you know, you're, for those who are not familiar with it, it's a way of allowing students and researchers and scholars at every stage in the, uh, in the career hierarchy moving around Europe, getting research grants and, 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 and enriching each other. And it's really, you know, it's really, I think, very much at the heart of what the EU is, is about. Uh, and I would love to see something similar in the GCC, especially now uh, that we have a much more differentiated knowledge environment than we would have had, say, 50 years ago, the knowledge environment was homogeneously non-existent almost. Uh, now it's, there is something uh, vaguely respectable and, uh, and certainly much more uh, diverse and heterogeneous. And therefore there is great, there are great gains to be had from a, a researcher who is in Jeddah going to, you know, uh, Sharjah, a researcher from Sharjah going to Kuwait, a researcher from Kuwait going to Bahrain and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. And uh, thank you in particular for addressing, I guess, the, the colloquial um, elephant in the room of how, you know, European Gulf relations are, of course, uh, to a certain extent articulated uh, in relation to what the U.S. is also doing and what the U.S. Gulf relations are. And as we've seen lately, how, you know, uh, sometimes what, what is assumed to be very common interest between the U.S. and uh, European powers is sometimes not not so conventions perhaps including in the gulf so that's uh, that's a, a very important topic and thank you and uh last but certainly not least adele you've been very patient and thank you again uh for your work uh, with sylvia and everyone else on this uh volume you wrote uh, in particular a very stimulating chapter uh with andrew leber when you uh, where you analyze uh the possibility and potential of uh, European involvement in facilitating the, the emergence of a new Gulf security architecture. Um, and um, I was wondering, could you please talk briefly about the current security and politics challenges and opportunities between uh, the EU and the GCC? Great, thank you very much, uh, Emma, and thank you very much for the Institute for hosting us. It's great to be uh, with uh, friends and, and colleagues. Uh, over Zoom, and hopefully we can all be together again uh, in person uh, soon. As many of uh, my colleagues have highlighted in their presentations, the EU-GCC partnership uh, has not reached its full uh, potential. Uh, and this is a key message that we have in our book, which, uh, which you alluded to, which has it's organized in three components. First, focuses on social issues. The second focus on economic issues, and the final one focuses on security and political issues. So today I'll focus more uh, on the security uh, uh, component. Uh, needless to say, uh, it has been a, a challenging time uh, uh, the past couple of years for Gulf uh, security. We have, uh, of course, the inter-GCC uh, strife with the Gulf uh, crisis. We have the breakdown of uh, the uh, JCPOA. Uh, and arguably the failure of the Trump administration's maximum pressure policy uh, on Iran. We have also seen uh, attacks on uh, Saudi oil installations. We have seen attacks uh, on uh, tankers in the Straits of Hormuz, and of course, uh, the war in Yemen, to name uh, a couple of the hot button uh, issues that have been unfolding and are unfolding in the region. Uh, of course, much has been written about uh, uh, the retreat uh, of uh, the U.S. Uh, from the region, and there are multiple views uh, on this. But despite uh, 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 that uh, rhetoric, this, the U.S. 
uh, still is the main security underwriter uh, and player of the region, albeit a reluctant uh, one, let's say, that seeking perhaps to limit its uh, uh, exposure to instability coming from uh, the region. But at, currently, the US uh, has about uh, 40,000 troops uh, in the Gulf, of course, much less than previously, but still a sizable presence uh, divided uh, between uh, GC countries, including in uh, the Fifth Fleet in, in Bahrain, the Lourdes base in Qatar, and other military installations in Saudi, UAE, and, uh, and Kuwait. Uh, but as the US is the main security underwriter, there's been a, a growing perception from the GCC that uh, the US is no longer the most reliable partner or the reliable partner it once has, has had uh, over the past uh, decades. Of course, this perception can really be uh, traced from uh, uh, the Arab Spring in 2011, where uh, Arab uh, certain uh, GCC capitals were not really happy with uh, uh, how the US did not back its, uh, some of its uh, 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 client regimes, let's say, uh, in the region. And of course, since then, mul multiple things have happened in various administrations, Dem Democrat and Republican. Of course, we have uh, Obama, uh, President Obama not enforcing the red lines in Syria. We have uh, also even during President uh, Trump's administration, which was very close to Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, uh, we have attacks on Saudi oil installations, and we also don't have uh, a massive reaction from the Trump administration. Uh, and even though that some Gulf capitals thought that they 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 would back uh, he would back them against uh, Iran, and of course, currently under the the Biden administration, we've seen the hasty uh, uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, which has uh, basically had ramifications uh, across uh, the region. So. Uh, the picture says that there's a clear direction from the GCC side to diversify their foreign policy uh, and their security uh, 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 relations. So who can fill uh, some of the gap? It's not an easy question uh, uh, to ask. So of course, the, the first that comes to mind is, uh, is China. Uh, but however, despite uh, growing uh, relations with uh, each of the GCC countries, China cannot underwrite and does not want to underwrite uh, uh, Gulf security and is described uh, in the literature as a security uh, uh, free uh, rider, but it is playing a growing uh, uh, role. And of course, as the US-China uh, rivalry shapes the century, uh, uh, this will actually uh, force uh, GCC leaders to continue to balance between uh, uh, both uh, uh, powers. Russia has its own vision of uh, regional security architecture, but again, similar to China, does not have the capability or the willingness to underwrite uh, regional uh, security in, uh, in the Gulf. Uh, of course, most recently, we've seen that Riyadh uh, has signed an agreement with Moscow, military cooperation uh, agreement. Uh, it's not clear what are the components of this agreement, uh, but it shows that Russia wants to play a bigger role. But it also highlights how uh, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, is sending signals perhaps to Washington uh, in terms of its displeasure with current uh, relations and to show that it has other uh, options. So this is the complex picture that we have uh, in regional uh, security in the Gulf. So the question is, can Europe play a larger role in uh, regional security architecture? Unfortunately, there's no easy answer to this. Of course, Europe does definitely have uh, leverage and has a big role, but definitely this is more in the economic realm and less in the security uh, realm. Uh, when it comes to security, the, the, uh, the Europe already plays a bit uh, of a role, but it's a very limited one. Of course, uh, my colleague Sylvia spoke about the European-led maritime awareness in the States of Hormuz uh, mission. Uh, this is a key comp a component of, uh, uh, of Europe's posture in, in the region. And actually, this, this mission has been received very positively in the Gulf, with Gulf officials viewing it uh, as uh, uh, favorably as an increased burden uh, sharing. Another component of uh, security uh, is, of course, uh, uh, weapons uh, sales to the region from European countries, uh, which are uh, sizable. Whether, of course, this contributes to security or insecurity is, is a matter of, uh, of opinion, but, of course, uh, European weapons are, are a component of this uh, uh, picture. Uh, but definitely it's in, in the bilateral uh, uh, area where uh, Europe, European states and Gulf states cooperate on uh, security. So less in a multilateral uh, format and more in a bilateral format. Uh, for example, we have the UAE has a treaty with, uh, with uh, Greece uh, uh, in terms of, uh, it's a comprehensive strategic treaty that has a defense 
component. We've also seen uh, very close uh, UAE uh, French uh, ties. Uh, last week was a big week for uh, foreign policy in France. In one day, uh, MBZ uh, uh, was visiting uh, Macron, and the same day, of course, the, the, the withdrawal from the uh, submarine deal from Australia uh, uh, happened on, on actually the same day. So a big day for, for French foreign policy uh, uh, makers last uh, week, big good or big bad, depending on how uh, you look at it. So, but as a multilateral organization, there is the role of Europe is uh, has been uh, uh, limited. So in, in the book, we argue that Europe can play a bigger role, uh, definitely in, in two ways. First of all, uh, definitely building up on the maritime protection efforts, uh, given there's a big need uh, and given the attacks that have been unfolding uh, uh, on, on oil tankers, there's definitely a need to step up uh, the maritime uh, component. And I think Europe can definitely play a larger role uh, in that. The second uh, area is definitely a, uh, a reconfigured JCPOA. There's a, there's a trend for de-escalation now that has been uh, for the last uh, for the past couple of months, we have uh, de-escalation uh, and uh, between Saudi and the UAE uh, on one on one side and Iran. We have this escalation between Saudi, UAE, and Egypt on one hand, and uh, Turkish Qatari axis on on another. So it seems that de-escalation is uh, is is uh, is should be really harnessed at this uh, uh, stage. Of course, uh, we do not know how negotiations will unfold. Uh, uh, President Ra Raisi in, uh, in Iran has uh, assumed power uh, and negotiations will, will potentially start uh, again. But of course, we, don't, we cannot assume that the Biden administration will run towards uh, a reconfigured JCPOA deal, considering the debacle that has happened in Afghanistan. Uh, and of course, the midterm election uh, in, in the US uh, uh, next year will also uh, have an impact on that. So I don't see that the Biden administration rushing into a new deal. Having said that, there is definitely uh, potential for a deal to, to happen. And uh, also on the Iranian side as well, there's definitely a, a, a potential there, despite uh, uh, Raisi being from a faction that is a quote unquote hardliner, uh, the economic imperatives for Iran to engage and re-engage in a deal are, are strong. You know, we've seen very high uh, inflation rates, with uh, higher unemployment rates, we've seen uh, oil strikes, uh, strikes in oil installations in Iran. We've seen protests against uh, uh, electricity and, and water shortages. So there's definitely uh, a bit going there in the country that uh, uh, Raisi has to overcome. Uh, he has an economic plan. He wants to be, boost economic productivity. He wants to boost uh, the private sector. He wants to increase uh, uh, non-oil uh, export revenue share of the economy. He also wants to uh, the Iranians in the diaspora to increase their investments uh, in Iran. All of this is not going to happen, uh, is unlikely to happen without a new deal and without the easing of, of sanctions. So on the Iranian side, we have uh, this willingness uh, uh, potential willingness to, to engage. And also this has been reciprocated from the Gulf side. And we've seen yesterday actually uh, uh, Saudi King's uh, uh, speech, recorded speech to the, to the UN, had some very conciliatory uh, 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 words towards Iran uh, and how the both countries can uh, work together. So again, the second point is that Europe can definitely play a bigger role in a reconfigurated uh, JCPOA. And finally, and I want to close on this, uh, I think any cooperation in the security uh, realm between the EU and the GCC is not only dependent on the EU, it really depends on the GCC uh, as an organization uh, and the perception on, on the current crop of GCC leaders on how important is the GCC as a vehicle for multilateral uh, uh, discussions and forum. But we can discuss this in the Q&A. Thanks, Emma. Thank you very much, Adel, and uh, thank you for making my job so easy. Um, and indeed, uh, I think when the 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 way uh, the GCC as a regional entity evolves, and uh, you know, especially after the Alula Agreement, uh, is one important aspect of what are we looking uh, what what are we looking at in terms of path forward within the GCC and between uh, European countries, EU countries or European country at large and Gulf countries, I think that's that's definitely one of the, the, the important aspects to look at today. And um, I would actually say that um, 
and it relates, we have a couple of questions coming from the audience that relate to the, the other aspects. You have the GCC evolution, but you also have a European evolution. Uh, so I would say three questions to keep in mind uh, as common threads in the, in the background as you, as you answer, answer the, 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 the follow-up question that I will, that I will uh, give you is the GCC evolution in itself after the Alula agreement but also the, the EU evolutions and um, two of the questions that we got from the audience talk about the European Green Deal on one hand and uh, another question asks about uh, the impact of the Brexit. Uh, so this is on the European end. And then the third common thread that has an impact obviously on uh, European Gulf relations is the evolution of the US role and presence in in the region and how European countries articulate their own presence and initiatives um, in, in, in reaction uh, to that, uh, at, at least partly. So with that in mind, uh, I, I, I will take one of the, the expression that you used actually, Sylvia, earlier, you uh, talked about unleashing the potential of the uh, Europe-Gulf relations. So be it EU-GCC or Europe-Gulf relation, I, I wanted to throw this question back to you and, and ask how do you unleash the potential of this relation today? Um, and, and for instance, I mean, starting with you, Sylvia, but, but everyone uh, can jump in obviously on, on your specific angle. But I was wondering, we talk about the GCC as, you know, a regional entity that is known to be very flexible in terms of its initiatives. You can have a couple of countries uh, starting an initiative and every other uh, country that's interested in that initiative within the GCC can join. So I was wondering if that sort of flexibility of variable geometry in relation and, and relationships and content could be a, a path forward, in your opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a tough question. I mean, uh, how to unleash the potential of a relationship that uh, has suffered uh, uh, many shortcomings for the past, uh, I mean, uh, 30 years. Um, I would respond in two ways, uh, and mainly from the European point of view, of course, because I think that a lot of work has to be done on that side in order to really uh, move, move forward. And in this respect, I'm a bit reluctant and skeptical um, about the fact that the EU really sees the Gulf in general and the GCC countries more uh, in particular as key strategic partners and hence uh, driven towards uh, uh, putting the revamp of the EU GCC relations of a more, a more of, or of a more robust Europe Gulf relationship at the, the top of their priorities, given the conditions that exist today in Europe, Europe's foreign policy. Uh, first and foremost, I see that uh, yes, uh, the this uh, this withdrawal or retrenchment of the U.S. from the region, which is more and more real, as as we see uh, below our eyes with the uh, post Afghanistan, Iraq, and potentially also Syria. Uh, yes, it, it's, a, it's a withdrawal of a military and physical presence in the Middle East in particular, not so much from the Gulf, I would say, but the EU and policymakers have been quite uh, reluctant uh, so far, in my view, to acknowledge uh, the fact that this means uh, that uh, there is uh, a gap, there is a space that could potentially be filled also by the EU in terms of, uh, you know, um, stepping up uh, its uh, security uh, initiatives. As Adel said, I mean, it's, it's very clear. I mean, uh, the Gulf in particular will remain under the security kind of uh, umbrella framework, how we want to call it, of the US, uh, notwithstanding uh, the physical presence that has been uh, reduced in the region overall, because, I mean, the Gulf uh, it really represents this important chain, I mean, with respect to uh, uh, China, Southeast Asia, I mean, global markets and so on and so forth for the US. It is important for Europe as well. But if you see at the specific agendas of the European institutions uh, and foreign policy, the, the call for more strategic autonomy and the, all of this, uh, and the areas in which the EU member states in particular, uh, those that are more active on the foreign policy and security front, because not all of them actually have 
this kind of uh, of uh, of activism and it's not necessarily tied to the gulf i mean the, the gulf does not uh, top the the, uh, the agenda there is a much uh, more uh, um, uh, shifting focus towards, uh, I mean, more neighboring uh, regions. Uh, of course, yeah, now we have the big issue of Afghanistan, but also in this respect, I doubt that, uh, I mean, with all the importance that the Gulf can represent, uh, can, the important role that the Gulf can play is as a, as a, as a, as a link between Afghanistan and, and the West, but at the same time, uh, Europe's attention is really driven some, somewhere else. And I think, uh, of course, first and foremost to North Africa, the Sahel, there where most of the really strategic assets and problems and challenges come from. So I really, uh, I think that, I mean, <laughs> I have written or co-edited a book on UGC relations, uh, trying to argue that it is important, of course, that the EU looks at this uh, region in a strategic way, also brings in alternatives uh, for alternative forms of cooperation. But I'm not entirely sure, uh, talking from a policy-oriented perspective, that the EU is able to acknowledge this and make the uh, really the, take the take the the, the role upon uh, upon itself. And I'll stop here for now. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on this, the, the European perspective and the, the evolution on the European side that could impact this relation? Because before we we switch to the other side and the evolution of the GCC, uh, especially when it comes to the the, the question about um, how does the the Brexit impact uh, said said relation, uh, and or the in terms of prioritization of of issues the European Green Deal. Does anyone want to jump in on that? Adel, I see. Did you want to jump in? Not Almar had the Brexit uh, uh, question, but I think uh, I just want to allude to the broader context that Sylvia mentioned is and her tension in the, in the introductory comments that there is a tension between the bilateral and the multilateral. So again, the European side, uh, of course, uh, each country has its own interests and it's, it's, this is not a GCC problem uh, in its own way. It's also a problem that the, the EU has with the North Africa and with other partners. Does the EU want to act in a unified uh, uh, manner or are these embassies across the region pursuing their, their own uh, interests? But on the Brexit question, I'll defer to Omar. Uh, thanks, Ada. Yeah, so I think that uh, Brexit, the UK leaving the European Union uh, is a two-edged sword again for, for, these, for the economic integration. On the negative side, uh, a country, especially from in the, in the case of a country like Bahrain, which has a historically uh, a close relationship with the UK, uh, it pushes it towards less, you know, this is a factor pushing towards less relations because Bahrain will just further deepen, for example, with the UK rather than engaging because you can get a lot of what it wants from the UK in, in terms of its relationship with the EU. And actually prior to the UK leaving the European Union, uh, the GCC was the European Union's fifth trading partner. Now it's the eighth, I think, uh, trading partner because a lot uh, the UK was overrepresented in those uh, in those relations. But on the positive side, I think that the UK leaving when if, if the e, when the UK leaves and starts striking trade deals, if that happens, I mean, it's done it with Japan. I think it's doing it with Australia at the moment and several other Commonwealth countries. If the UK continues to have success in striking uh, free trade deals, then I think that's an impetus for the EU to uh, uh, move a bit forwards a little bit more uh, uh, with a bit more uh, aggress aggressiveness or a bit more uh, impetus because. Uh, because I, to be honest, I don't know what the EU is waiting for uh, in terms of a free trade agreement with the GCC. It just seems like they're getting in each other's, getting their own way. Uh, uh, and hopefully the, you know, Brexit is, is it will be a, 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 a signal to them that, you know, we're denying ourselves an opportunity. It's not as if the GCC, you know, when, you know, when the EU did a trade relationship with, with, with the Mercosur, with the, you know, South America, these are countries that manufacture a lot of things which can penetrate European markets. The Gulf countries don't really produce anything. So it's not like, you know, millions of European jobs are at stake because, because you know, the GCC is going to be uh, 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 producing, uh, uh, its, its exports are going to be ending. So really the EU, I think, just needs to have a, a, a mental cleansing session and, and realize that there's, a, there's an easy opportunity here uh, and it should take it. 
Go ahead, Hannah. Yeah, just to jump on that, I think traditionally, and I mean, similar to trade and foreign policy, education and training cooperation has also been on that bilateral level, and it's been predominantly with the UK. So, you know, there are other, for instance, with vocational colleges, there are a couple of other, you know, um, European colleges that have partnered with uh, with Saudi ones to offer training. Um, but generally speaking, it's m- mostly British ones. And so that, that does kind of influence it, it, it kind of does again say well it's it's diluted the amount of cooperation with the EU now that uh, the UK is not part of it so there's that there's that issue but then there's also the language issue I mean in schools within the GCC you know again you're not talking about North Africa and within the GCC students learn English as a second language predominantly and now in like in Saudi Arabia for instance they're also learning Chinese and so these are issues to consider they're, they didn't introduce French or um, you know uh, or Italian or another language it wasn't a European one and so I think that it's important to think about that as well as in general the relationships have been bilateral and also then you know who with uh, I think is a really important question there's a lot of opportunities there's more cooperation with France on for instance um, uh, military training for instance so this, this is interesting as well, uh, kind of based on what we, we were talking about earlier. Uh, but I think it's, it is an opportunity to reflect, absolutely, as Amar said. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, it's a it's an excellent point to, to add to, to this, the, the, the language dimension, for sure. And, uh, and to follow up, to continue this, this conversation on the unleashing this potential, but looking at both sides of the equation, uh, we have a couple of questions following up on uh, the, you're, you're mentioning the, the FTA, Omar. Um, one of the question is actually on the, the FTA, but looking from, from the perspective of the, of the Gulf. And, uh, and there's also a question on this, uh, the, the, the framework of EU GCC or EU Gulf relations. So the first question is uh, on the FTA in the context of a possible resumption of negotiations around EU GCC FTA, how do you assess the recent news that the UAE has started bilateral negotiations on trade agreement with eight countries outside of the GCC framework? Isn't that a further element that weakens the framework of a bi-regional trade agreement? So that's one question looking at the, 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 the Gulf side of the equation. And the other one is uh, it, that this person concurs with the need to switch from an EU GCC relations to EU Gulf relations, but uh, saying that this can only be done if the existing tensions with other regional players, for example, Iran, are addressed. And uh, this person wants to know what your views are on that. So regarding the uh, bilateral, so recall that Bahrain and Oman both have bilateral free trade agreements with the US, uh, even while there's supposedly a GCC customs union operating. Uh, And what I would say is that the GCC uh, uh, trade uh, uh, arrangements are quite pragmatic and and, and flexible. even when the uh, Qatar uh, uh, embargo was was in operation, <laughs> the customs were actually working very well, and it's one of the elements of the of the GCC uh, 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 GCC bureaucracy that, that's been the most effic- efficient and effective. So uh, I, I'm confident that even if the UAE or any other country goes off and does its own bilateral relations, somehow they'll fudge it and 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 and, and get through it. And I wouldn't consider that a barrier. Uh, the the, the uh, people who work, and I know a lot of them personally, who work in the customs elements, of, uh, the GCC representatives of customs from different countries, they know how to get the job done when they're working with each other, uh, and it's one of the most uh, one of the you know most best functioning elements of the of the GCC. Regarding uh, 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 the second question, a reminder it was uh, it was the. Uh, it was about the necessity of uh, of tensions uh, between regional players yeah. and including between the two shores of the Gulf be- needing to be addressed before before the possibility of expanding the framework from EU GCC to Europe Gulf. Yeah. So before, I mean, actually, you know, the the Arab world uh, is pretty poor in terms of its economic integration, even setting aside any. Arab-Persian conflict, even within the Arab world, the level of integration is, is, is abysmal, to be frank. 
uh, uh, there are some sort of overarching uh, free trade agreements, I think, at the Arab League level. But, but in terms of the actual volume of actually intra-Arab country trade is very low. Uh, uh, if you look at, you know, countries that are close to each other are supposed to be trading a lot. The Arab countries don't trade very much for a long list of reasons, um, let alone trade with Iran, trade with Turkey, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So what I would say is actually before the EU considers the question, you know, before addressing, uh, uh, you know, decreasing tensions between say, for example, Iran and, 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 and the Arab Gulf states as, as a precursor to further integration with the EU negotiations, uh, the, the whole Arabic Arabian Peninsula in the Arab world, the Middle East in general, whether you include Iran or not, needs to uh, work a little bit harder on you know, realizing uh, the economic benefits on offer from, from well-designed economic integration, let alone, you know, putting aside any, any goals of integrating with the EU. One area where things are heading in the right direction and will act as a precursor to going in the right direction with the EU is electricity. So the grids in the Middle East are, into, so the GCC has an excellent grid and it's working very well. And they're integrating with Iraq and with Jordan. And you can see, so a lot of a lot of Saudi overtures towards Iraq are relating to to attempt to supply Iraq with electricity in an attempt to you know make better ties with Iraq. Uh, and the holy grail in the long run is by having the EU grid linked to the Gulf grid, uh, and that would be a fantastic uh, uh, step in the right direction. Whether it's in terms of climate protecting the environment or uh, realizing economic benefits. Because if there's one area where there are huge benefits to trade from both sides, it's electricity, if you can get the grids operation. Thank you very much, Homa. Um, and following up on this, this uh, question more broadly on what is in the impact of the evolutions on the, on the Gulf side of the equation and uh, uh, piggybacking on my previous question on how do you see, where do you see the GCC going from now uh, after the Alula agreement and what uh, what challenges and or opportunities do you see for EU GCC relations going forward, looking from the, the GCC side of things? Um, does anyone else want to jump in on this? Uh, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think definitely from, uh, as I ended my comments, uh, it really also depends on the willingness uh, of the GCC side to act as a GCC. We've seen definitely this, this uh, the de escalation happening since the Al-Ola uh, declaration, uh, most recently uh, leaders meeting in uh, casually uh, in, in Saudi Arabia uh, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, uh, uh, some of these Gulf countries have also pursued uh, potentially zero sum games uh, uh, in terms of economic competition, for example. Uh, and this has really escalated actually over the past period for example, between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, who are uh, perceived to be in, in, in lockstep, but actually have had their own uh, disagreements. Actually, the, the custom union issue that Omar mentioned, of course, uh, that uh, Saudi Arabia has, has changed, should have been dealt with in a GCC framework. But of course, Saudi Arabia uh, went ahead with that and had an impact on, on, uh, on, on the UAE. Uh, but also how uh, Riyadh really wants to poach lots of uh, uh, multinationals to be headquartered there uh, and so on. So uh, I, I don't see this economic cooperation, uh, economic uh, competition going anywhere. Maybe competition is actually pretty healthy, uh, but it does not have to be a zero, zero sum uh, zero sum game uh, because ultimately these uh, the, the countries have the same challenges. Yeah, you have we're transitioning to a post oil economy. We have dwindling uh, hydrocarbon resources. Uh, we have issues of climate change and we have an uncertain security environment. Uh, so it's really up to the current crop of leaders to decide whether they uh, really want to uh, make the GCC into a, a viable uh, uh, sort of working uh, organization. Uh, or uh, it's, it sort of remains uh, as a vehicle. Of course, Saudi Arabia has an oversized role uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the GCC. There's also an element of rising nationalism uh, uh, over the last couple of years that we've seen. Uh, uh, and perhaps this is healthy, uh, but also uh, has unhealthy uh, elements uh, of it uh, as well. So. Uh, the current crop has is, is actually the older crop of uh, leaders have been able to deal with many of these issues under uh, behind closed doors 
uh, the current crop has uh, has been a bit is a bit more forceful uh, and so on. But there are positive indications, but we have to see where these uh, take us. If this if this escalation is uh, sort of for now, or is it the long term? Uh, to to rebuild the GCC as an institution and rebuilding the, the GCC as an institution will actually or building it further will involve some hard decisions. Uh, you know the EU as an institution uh, has devolved uh, the, sorry European countries have devolved some of their powers to a, a supranational institution. Uh, this is very unlikely to happen in the Gulf where it's a very top down uh, decision uh, making and of course. Uh, 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 non-democratic compared to, to Europe. So uh, the, the uh, comparison holds, but does not hold when it comes to, in terms of governance. Thank you very much, Adel. Anyone else wanted to uh, jump in from, from their perspective on the, the evolution of the GCC and where that could represent a challenge or an opportunity for bi-regional relations? Uh, if Silva wants to talk then by all means, Silvia, did you want to say something? No, it was uh, going back to the other issue of uh, Europe Gulf. So sorry. <laughs> Please go. Briefly to add to add this issue on, uh, on what, as you mentioned, the competition. Uh, I, I know that the, uh, there's generally seem to people to take a very negative, quite a negative view of the competition. Although, as Adam mentioned, it can be a good thing. I point out that in the EU, you know, Paris, London, previously, obviously, uh, uh, Berlin, Amsterdam, all these cities compete regularly uh, and uh, uh, for all sorts of uh, uh, things, whether it's the mundane, like where this, where European Commission office will be, or whether it's something more high uh, profile, like where, you know, financial uh, uh, leading banks will be and so on and so forth. This is normal. This is healthy. I agree that under certain circumstances, it could be done in a way that is potentially negative some. Um, but uh, I think that for the most part, you know, uh, the, Gulf, the, the Middle East is a, is, a, is a region that is starved of good governance. The competition between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, between the UAE and Qatar, Saudi, Qatar, whatever, when it comes to attracting foreign capital and so on, is generally one thing that it does lead to is better governance in all of these areas, better quality regulations, uh, uh, better quality uh, uh, legal systems, uh, even if it's in a, in a, a restricted to a, to a commercial domain. Uh, so while there might be some negatives in certain areas, overall, I would consider the competition to be net positive because it means a better quality uh, 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 government in, in all of these areas. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Uh, Sylvia, go ahead. Thank you. No, I wanted to pick up on the, the question of uh, switching to a UGCC or from, from a UGCC to a Europe Gulf framework, which, I mean, of course, I'm not uh, uh, saying that we should completely dismiss uh, the UGCC framework. Of course, it's been tremendously helpful in keeping this uh, line of communication open between uh, the two organizations uh, and also helping the GCC uh, remain afloat to some extent, at, at least in a specific uh, moment of time. But um, what I want to just underline is the fact that uh, in, in the Gulf, and I, I think we should really not just talk about the GCC countries and Iran, but also mention Yemen and and Iraq, who play an important role, a, a tremendous role in the kind of the, the configuration of this of this uh, sub-regional uh, uh, compact. Uh, um, I think really there are so many interdependencies that uh, perhaps Europe or uh, the European Union is not really aware aware of, but uh, they should not uh, really, uh, um, uh, they should really take in, be taken into account. I mean, issues such as the climate change related uh, issues, uh, uh, sustainable development, uh, Adel mentioned the maritime uh, dimension of security. Uh, it's all kind of shared. It's not just the EGCC side or uh, the Iranian side. So really, uh, also for the EU has been tremendously difficult to reconcile sometimes, you know, uh, it's bilateral relationship with Iran on the one hand and the other side of the framework of UGCC. I mean, tensions have been so deep that the EU has been paralyzed by them. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that really in order to move forward, uh, uh, I mean, keeping uh, the focus on the GCC for a number of uh, important aspects, uh, I think that the, the, the issue of the, I mean, the, the, the dimension of the economy is uh, the, the most important one and that should be worked out at the EU GCC level, but also 
also broadening the scope when talking, for example, about uh, security to the uh, full uh, Gulf is very important. Uh, and just to conclude, I mean, uh, the failure of the JCPOA, I mean, uh, we know, uh, uh, well, I mean, the, the unilateral withdrawal of the US, of course, the, the huge blow that was dealt to that, but also the failure to really become a basis for a more robust regional dialogue for security and security cooperation also stems from the fact that this particular agreement, non-proliferation agreement, was not integrated fully into regional uh, kind of developments. Of course, it's a, it's a huge issue. Uh, we can't discuss this. But uh, now that there is also this window of opportunity with Iraq and the dialogue between Saudi Arabia and Iran, I think also Europeans should grasp this opportunity to change a little bit their mindset and adapt their policies, of course, which is more and more difficult. Thank you, Sylvia. Hannah, I see. Yeah, I wanted to just wanna... jump. Yeah, I wanted to jump in and just kind of go back to um, to Amr's point on um, Erasmus, um, but also then bringing in the idea of competition and this idea of tension. So I think that you know the, one of the issues is that within on a cultural level within kind of GCC states, there really isn't as much. Um, interaction between average citizens with one another as one might assume from the outside. So there's skepticism and there is a lot of um, misunderstandings about what happens in the different countries. And then with the rise of kind of this nationalist movement, there's more of that. And it's not necessarily going toward the healthy competition. So having more of the cultural exchange through an education platform would definitely help alleviate this. Um, and as I mentioned, there are many more opportunities and more educational outlets where people could do this. Um, but not only on, on that level, but also at kind of the um, organizational level. So, you know, you do have a TVET, um, uh, joint GCC TVET council that meets. I don't really know what they do. I don't think that they do much together. I'm sorry if you do and you're just not telling everybody. But I think that the issue is what happens in at the EU level is you'll have something like CD4 which is the organization that sets TVET policies for the entire kind of EU, um, it's, it basically stimulates that positive competition. So the states are competing to have better educational institutions, are uh, aspiring to have better training institutions. And then there is a, an opportunity to go to these and an exchange of knowledge and, and, um, and policy as well. So I think that you know, there's an, an opportunity on the cultural level uh, within the education sector, as well as at that institutional policymaking level. Thank you very much for bringing this, this aspect back because that's actually the, the last question that I, I wanted to pose to you because I think one aspect of what we've discussed today is that is really important is, is not just looking at the Gulf uh, approach to it or, or the European approach to it, but actually looking into, and Sylvia mentioned that in terms of, you know, levels of actors. Are we talking about government or peoples? And what I've, what I've uh, heard a lot in, in all of your presentations today is the need to go deeper within within the the, the at the people level and um so in with with that i wanted to ask how can in your opinion how can the european union deepen its action and impact amidst the the peoples of the gcc or or further that that focus on the people aspects of uh, policies, be it economic, be it cultural and you know educational, be it security wise. Also, you know the the security dimensions that are that are centered on on the people, environmental security, food security, etc. So that's uh, the last question that I that I wanted to pose to you. What what is the the potential of changing or adding this this level in EU Gulf relations? Starting with you, Hannah. Okay, I'll start. I think that's a really important question. I think it's tricky because I also think that, you know, um, one of the biggest failures that people cite now looking at Afghanistan is the fact that the US was there for 20 years and with European uh, presence as well. Uh, and the one thing that they forgot to do really was learn about the culture. And so I think that, you know, that's really what they they actually came out and said that let's hope to, um, you know, put more into development instead of de defense in the future. Uh, and I think that it, it, it's a tricky thing because you do 
want to make sure that you're not patronizing and telling um, citizens that you're going to come and empower them because they already feel like there is an identity that exists and that there is an opportunity to really harness the the ambition that's there and i think that within some of the gcc states uh, specifically there is this idea that there's so much now that is happening that is changing um and i mean for instance again i'm saudi so i'll bring up saudi arabia as an example the ministry of tourism the ministry of culture the way they're really trying to build an industry where there wasn't one but incorporate existing amateur talent into it but then develop more of that this exchange of knowledge there's an opportunity to really harness i think kind of what is there and i think that that's really important and i i think that in my own experience in doing research with young people within the region um, they don't expect to be listened to or heard they, because they expect to be told what to do. And a lot of times they're looking for that direction. And I think the second you start engaging them, they get nervous and then excited to really share their ideas. And I think that what we need to do is just give more space to people to express what they want. And if that's what the EU can bring to the table, then that would be amazing. Thank you so much, Hannah. Anyone else wants to jump in from, from your aspect or perspective? Omar, you were talking about um, the, the potential of, of mobility within the GCC also in terms of economy. Yeah, I mean, the, the un unfortunately, there's a lack of appreciation on, on the uh, size of the opportunities available and, and how to best leverage them. I definitely think that in the knowledge domain, uh, I absolutely agree with what I just said about the, the, the mentality of youth being, you know, just that they're raised to, you know, just receive directions and knowledge and they're not used to having an opportunity to uh, experiment and explore. And, and in that sense, I completely concur with her that uh, uh, opening up a, a, an avenue within the GCC, then within the GC, between the GCC and the EU would be would be wonderful you know you you guys know better than i do about the eu's her rich heritage uh, in arts culture uh, expression uh, and and it would and, and we've seen some you know you've seen things up in the uae you mentioned your, your husband i think was in the louvre and we have a branch of the louvre in uh, in, in in abu dhabi and I think the Sorbonne University as well. So I think these are uh, these are in, in indications of the desire uh, uh, to to leverage and to fully explore these opportunities, but we're still not there yet, uh, uh, and and the sky's the limit. Thank you, Omar. Adel, did you want to? Yeah, jump I just in? have one quick final uh, comment. I think we we spoke, uh, we touched upon it briefly. Is definitely cooperation on on climate change. Definitely something that uh, European uh, young Europeans and, and older Europeans, of course, are very passionate about, and people also as well in in, in the Gulf. Uh, and there's definitely been a push from uh, GCC states very recently and over the past couple of months, actually, with a number of initiatives to really push. Uh, for uh, addressing issues of climate change. This is something we can really work on. There's been also an alliance of sovereign wealth funds uh, to, to make investments a bit more, more, more green. Uh, but I think this is an area at a people-to-people -people level where, 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 where work can also be, uh, uh, be done. Uh, uh, of course, I live in, in, in Doha, uh, I'm not currently there, but yeah, uh, Gulf capitals, uh, there's gonna be forecasts to 50, 50 plus uh, degrees. So it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite, uh, it, necessary to really work on climate change uh, in, in the Gulf. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, that's a very important point to add. Uh, unfortunately, we are about out of time. I would like to thank you so much for this uh, fruitful and very, very fascinating conversation. It was a pleasure to uh, discuss with you today. And with that, I will bring it back to Raymond for closing remarks. Thank you, Emma, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, special thanks to our speakers for making the time again to join um, and share their insights, and especially to our wonderful moderator, Emma Sofriye, for conducting such a, a captivating conversation. Um, I'm happy that we're able to, to uh, contribute to this important discussion, and we'll continue doing so through future programs and publications. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us with any feedback or questions. Uh, we have more webinars planned 
uh, for the co coming weeks uh, and make sure to visit our website, agsiw.org uh, and sign up to our weekly newsletter for regular analysis and updates. Uh, and final pitch uh, for the wonderful book uh, that, that all the, uh, our speakers have contributed to under the leadership of uh, Sylvia and Adel. Uh, so please, again, uh, feel free to uh, check out uh, the book on, on the Belgrade website and, and use the discount code uh, to, to purchase it. Uh, and with that, thank you all again, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.